Morty! We've got to turn the project in early! Hey everyone, how are we doing? It is Thursday. Oh my gosh, it's the end of the week! We got Casey here, we got Cassandra here, who all is in the chat. If you're in the chat, feel free to say hi. Charging on my phone here. Seeing what, what was the random thing? Oh, got the pickup. Good, good, good. Good, good, good stuff. Gonna get stuff picked up tomorrow, but who all is here? Let me see, they sent me a link. If you have questions, good tomorrow, good. Confirm appointment. Hi, Brian, could you go over question 12 about leaving class and catching the train? You bet. Awesome, I gotta pick up my suit from David's Bridal. Ah, doing some, did some alterations. So let me get my Pearson up here. I reset the computer last night, so things should be more smooth. Let's hope everything is running fine. And we'll put the first My Pearson question of the day about leaving class and catching the train. I was wondering if we go to the question about the favorite songs. Yeah, we'll do favorite songs. We got Catching Train from 201, Catching the Train, and we have favorite songs. So Stat 201, Chapter 12, Chapter 12, and Catching the Train. Oh my gosh. And then we got favorite songs. One of my favorite songs right here. Anything with piano is one of my favorite songs. We're loading everything. We'll have it here in just a moment. But how's everyone doing this morning? We're throwing out some Mubot points. Mubot, give out those points. He's learning all new commands. There's so many secret commands that people don't know about. Things like Hi Mubot or Pints. Mubot is always here hanging out. And let's go down here to chapter 12. Replace questions. We're almost there. About one more minute tops and we should be working on it. Opening up the Word document. You bought talking about some pine type. Oh my gosh. It's opened up all 10,000 Word documents I had. No, it only opened up like 10. That's good. It's good stuff. Okay. Got the Word document open. First one is the train question. Almost found the train question. Here we go. Found the train question. Let me take the timestamp and then we'll start this up. Join in on the question. Have some fun here. It's time for the train question. Let's do this. Okay. So this is the train question. And this one deals with uh, the multiplication rule. rule. And it's a little bit weird because the way it asks it, you might think it's not dealing with the multi multiplication rule. But I'm going to map out all the probabilities right here in the train question. Got a good bit of our documents open from yesterday, even though I reset the computer. So I want you to think about this. We have right here two different things that could occur. And there's going to be kind of a sub-event here. We have here a student figures they have a 61% chance of leaving uh, class late. So what is the probability they do not leave class late? This is the complement rule. So 61% probability, help me out in the chat right here. 61% probability they leave class late. What is the probability they're not late out of class? You're welcome, Hope. Good to see you here. What is the probability they're not late out of class? So 61% probability late out of class. Uh, so late, so we'll put probability of late right here is equal to 61%. What is the probability of not late? Probability, great job, Casey, right there, 100 points. Thank you for following along. Throw a point out in the chat there. 39% probability this is the compliment because they're, they're compliment because either they're late or not late. Now, inside of these, there's sub probabilities. The student is only going to miss the train. So if he is late, then there is a 75% chance he will miss the train. So within this are sub probabilities right here. There's going to be like sub probabilities that if he is late, he has a 75% chance of missing the train. So the probability of missing and we'll put probability of catching train. That's probability C is probability catch. So these are just these are just shorthands right here for probability he misses the train, which they said is 75%. And the probability of catching the train is equal to 25%. Now, the problem doesn't tell you this, but I wish it did. It should say if he's not late, he will catch the train. So this will maybe help with understanding what's going on right here, that if he's not late, he will catch the train. 
I might just disappear so we can see it over here. If he's not late, he will catch the train. So then we have to think about this as a sequence of events right here. If he's not late out of class, he will catch the train. Well, you can actually multiply these events when you think about it as an and. Like, what's the probability he's not late and he catches the train? Well, that would be uh, the probability of not late catch train is equal to 39% times 100. Because he's not late and then he catches the train. He'll catch it 100% of the time. So this is equal to 39%. And all of these probabilities work the following way. Still works with the same mathematics. We can go across this uh, next one and we can say, what's the probability he's late and then he catches the train and hear that keyword and. So we have the probability he's late out of class and then that's an and because we're multiplying the multiplication rule. And then he catches the train is 25%. So we need to multiply that. That's gonna be about, I think I can do it in my head. I think I can, I think I can. I think that's it. Let's see if I got it right. We're gonna double check our math, but I think that's correct. Let's check. Yep, it is good. That's the probability right there. And then the remaining probability, can you go over the soda? Yeah, we can do soda one too. You bet, Hope, you got it. Then the last probability right here is what if he's not late out of class? And then we're gonna say the and word, he's not late and he uh, misses the train, which is the one it wants. Now, interestingly enough, you could find this because this is everything that could occur by doing the complement of the probability of all these events. So if you know right here, we've done the addition of the events and the complement will be the remaining probability because this is everything that could occur. He's either not late and catches the train, late and catches the train, or he's late and misses the train. So this is everything that could occur. And we've just found the final probability of 0.61 times 0.75. And this would be that he is, we'll write right here. Uh, we'll write him right here. Late, misses, late, catches, not late, Catches. There is the not late uh, misses the train, but not late misses the train would be, we didn't write that probability, but it would be 0 0.39 times zero. And that is equal to zero, which we didn't even list it right here because he's not going to miss the train. Um, so the final probability down here on the bottom is the 45.75, I believe it was. Let's double check. And we can even do the math to double check it. There it is right there. 0.61 times 0.75. Oh my gosh. I need to, let me log out of Teams. How do I get out of Teams? I don't know. I'm old. <laughs> 0.61 times 0.75. And there it is right there. There is the probability we are looking for. And that will solve the question right here. And we've kind of written out all the probabilities. Ooh, round to three decimals. I think it would tell us we were wrong if we did it that way. If you ever have an answer like this and it tells you you're wrong, please let me know. Um, if you ever have a rounding issue. Oh, great job, Casey. Glad it makes sense right here. Uh, I like to draw all these out and help uh, explain what's going on. If you write all the probabilities down, we can usually figure it out. So that's kind of our goal right there. Let me go to the main screen. We'll get the next question going and let me get out of Teams. Ah! Microsoft Teams, what you doing on my screen? Microsoft Teams. Should have never logged in. Teams. How do I get out of Teams? Sign out of Teams. <laughs> there we go. I'm out of Teams. Not in Teams anymore. No more pop ups. We're looking into some new microphones. This microphone is amazing, but we might be doing some wireless options. So uh, thank you to Dwight and everybody. Uh, really big shout out to all of our teams at Haslam. Um, we're super lucky. Chapter 12, winning soda question. Okay, so we got favorite songs. And then we got winning sodas. Then we're done with questions. I mean, we should have more. Uh, but put your questions in the chat because we don't have that many more. We have two more right now. So we're, we need more questions, more things to work on. Here's the favorite song question. What's the timestamp on it? Favorite songs is at 10, 18. Let's do it here, favorite songs. Okay, so this is the favorite songs question. 
And this deals with the probabilities with the amount that occur in a set and the probability of a certain uh, amount occurring. Let's take a look. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about X over N. X is the number of ways things can occur and N is the number of total. So we'd say right here, what is the total amount of songs? Well, the total amount of songs is going to be the sum of all the songs in the playlist. So this is going to be the total right here. And we'd get here, all these added up is going to be seven plus three. And there we go, 16, nice number. I love 16, it's a very good divisible number. My sixes do look like zeros. I'm not good at writing. And now we ask, what is the probability of a randomly selected song being a rap song? So that is going to be uh, seven right here as the denominator um numerator oh my gosh i have to i have to learn i gotta learn some basic math again and so with this right here seven is going to be the numerator because that's the amount of probability we have for rap songs hey brian could you go over one e of course yeah shiv great stuff right there let me write that down right here as we're doing this one thank you shiv for asking please ask questions while i'm doing questions i i do mean that because that helps me line up the next few questions uh assignment five one e we'll talk about some one e you bet shiv um, I've got that here after the next one, the soda question, we'll do it. And seven sixteenths is got to work it in your brain. Got to be like, do, 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 come on brain. So it's, it's a half of a half. So it's, oh my gosh, my brain's slowing down. No, it's 0 0.4375. I think so. Let's check 0 0.4375, seven dash 0 0.4375. Good. Always try to work a math problem in your head because if you get it right, then you're like, yes, confirmation. You get a little fun math game right there. The vehicle question, yeah, we'll do some vehicle question, you bet. And then uh, the next one says, what is the probability it's not country? Well, this is the compliment right here. The compliment is when we say something is not something. So now we have to figure out the probability of country. And the probability of country is going to be this. Now this is the probability of country. The probability of not country is that. So whenever we say it's not something, it's one minus. So the probability of country is going to be, oh my gosh, they're doing so much. They're doing nice probabilities, 18.75. And then the probability of not country is 81.25. So it's going to solve out to 81.25, I think. I think, maybe. 81.25, there we go. And as long as you follow through correctly, you should have it. You should have it. There we go. Don't round answers. Check answers. We got it. We're on a streak. We haven't gotten something wrong for like a week, week and a half. Woo. Woo. We're going we're gonna to get a question wrong today. I feel it. I feel it, but not today. Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. So that's got that question right there. There is the uh, song question. We're going to do the soda question next. Okay. Let's get the soda question going here. Ah, uh, the soda question, winning some soda cans. This is a tough question. We'll get it right, don't worry. But this one requires a lot of steps. And uh, this one is one where people usually get to on the test and they're like, I got no idea, but I wanna give you confidence right here. I want you to have confidence in your ability to solve these questions. So check it out here, the soda question. Let's do it. Now this is in at least one problem. And the way to solve these problems is to write it out like a word problem. And let's go right here and grab the question. It says, what is the probability you win something? Well, let's go to a Word document and start working on this. So for a sales promotion, the manufacturer places winning symbols under 13% of the caps. Immediately, we're gonna jot down that information right here. And we're gonna put right here that the probability of winning something is equal to 13%. Now we can find out the complement, which is gonna be the probability of not winning something. Um, we wanna look at the probability of not winning next. Probability not win, you either win or you do not win. Um, one of those things must occur because they're complements. And you can always do a complement by saying not of something, like this occurs or this does not occur. And so the probability of not winning is 87%. If you buy a six pack of soda, what is the probability that you win something? And let me color code it this way. Can anyone show me what has happened in my six pack of soda? Just take a moment. I want you to think through this because this is going to help if we write down as a word problem. Can anyone tell me 
what I've done right there. The, look at the six pack. Look at the color coding. This is happy day for you. Um, what has happened with that six pack of soda? You look at that and you're like, ooh, bro, I got the best six pack ever. Why is that awesome right there? Why are you super happy? If you have coffee. Why is this such a good day with that six pack? You're like, yes, yes, so good. Very improbable thing just happened right here. There's six cans of soda. They're all colored yellow to color code and tell us what just happened. What just happened with that six pack of soda? It's gonna help if we visualize this and kind of see what's going on with this problem and then think about what we need to find right here. This is not what we need to find yet, but it's helping us conceptualize what we're doing right here. We're literally buying a six pack of soda and then opening up the six pack and checking the caps. And what just happened on that six pack of soda? That six pack is the luckiest six pack ever because that six pack of soda, we just won on every one. It doesn't matter. No. Wow. There we go. Owen Wilson's impressed. Rock is not impressed. So with this, we have to think about other scenarios though. There's other things that could occur. Quite clearly, we could have the scenario like this right here, which is probably more likely. And in this instance, we only won one time as color coded right there. And we're just pretending we buy six packs of soda and we're opening them up and we just see if we win. So in this instance, we won two times. It says, what is the probability of winning something? So there's many different ways that could, this could occur. We could win on one soda can, two, three, four, five, six, but there's an instance where we don't win something because either, let's write this down mathematically. I want to go to the end of this. There we go. It will be the case that either all six are losers or one is a winner. Please take a moment right here and tell me when I say the word or, what does this mean mathematically? Put a mathematical symbol in the chat right now if you're following along. When I say or, because like you you can't, every soda can can't be a loser or one win, one, at least one is a winner or at least, let me write at least. There we go. It can't be the case that all six are losers or at least one is a winner. That can't both happen. You open them up and they're all losers. Then you didn't get at least one winner. There's two winners in my example. Then it wasn't the case that they were all losers. These are dichotomous events right here, meaning that they can't occur at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. They're disjoint, all the good words we know. And with this, one of them must occur. This is everything that could occur. You're either gonna get all losing, all losing bottles here, or you'll have at least one winner. And what we need to know is when we hear the word or, well, one, I said it was disjoint because they both can't happen at the same time. And two, this turns into a plus right here. So when we say, or we want to think of the word, you know, plus mathematically, we're adding them. So how about we try to find one of these probabilities? Well, this is the one we're trying to solve for in the problem. So literally this becomes a solve for Y problem. If we just put that as Y, it might help to see it that way. Cause you're just going to solve for Y. Well, mathematically we can take and put this over to the other side now by subtracting it. We're going to subtract it from both sides right here. And then you can see to solve for Y, which is at least one winner. We'll track the Y with a little color coding right here. So this is what we're interested in, at least one winner. And we've recoded it as Y just to make it kind of simple solve for Y problem. It's just been kind of re-expressed like we are looking for at least one winner, which is the probability right there, Y. So with this, we need to find out the probability all six or are losers. I'm having trouble getting for us to work on so question one. Yes. Uh, Send me your code, Adam, in the Discord, or let me know. Let me see. Uh, which question one part? Question one part, what for 475? Let me know. Shiv has a, we're going to do some 475 here in a moment. Good questions, Adam. And so we need to find the probability all six are losers. Well, that would be the scenario of the following. The first is a loser, and the second is a loser, and the third is a loser, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And I said, and... So if I'm saying the first is a loser, there's the probability of it, and the second is a loser. And so we need to write out the following. Part 1C, oh cool, look at part 1C. So here's the probability, the first is a loser, the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And what do we have to assume when we multiply? These are key things we know. Teresita, good to see you here. Let me know if you have questions. What, we, what do we have to assume when we multiply probabilities? Because I'm gonna open one of the bottles and it was a loser, 
and then the next one's a loser. So what do I have to assume about the probability of this um, kind of with the last probability, which I'm multiplying it by? I have to assume that each of these things are what to each other when you multiply. If you are multiplying, you would have to assume that each soda bottle you open is what of the previous soda bottle. You open this one, then you open this one, then you open this one, and we're saying the word and right here when we multiply. You'd assume that each one is independent of the previous one. So the first soda bottle is independent. Its winning probability is independent of the second one and of the third and of the fourth and the fifth and of the sixth, such that Rock knows it doesn't matter. that time he's right, whether we win on the first or the second when it comes to the third. Each of these is an independent trial of trying to win a soda. So this right here is the probability of all six being losers. The first is a loser and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And this could be re-expressed again. Do, 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 do. Uh, simply, there we go. And so now we're just going to take and multiply two, three, four, five, six, and then one minus, and there's the probability. So solving for Y is the following, and that is the probability of at least one winner, which is what we were tracking the whole time. We had that as Y right there. And think about this mathematically. It is the case that if everything occurs but all losers, you will have at least one winner. It's like everything but all losers, that's the way that is read, is at least one winner. But it might make more sense to go back to the beginning where we're saying you will either lose on all six or you will have at least one winner. And then as you see, we solved for Y across. We did the algebra down. So make sure to follow the algebra. These are some tricky problems. I got one C to work. I can, all oh, good stuff right there. Love it. Big shout outs to our Discord. I uh, just got another message on Discord. Big shout outs to the Discord. Uh, a lot of people helping each other out. A lot of people working together in a great way. That's what we love to see. Trying to grow it even more uh, because really we want people working together in a positive fashion. We want people helping each other. Uh, that's kind of the goal right there. I sent you my unfinished code. Awesome. I think we're about to do Shiv's problem right here. Let's go check this out. Shiv, I got one single word. Awesome. Let's see. We're going to play this one. I really listen to this one. This song's really good. I think I'm playing. Yep. Yesterday's office hours or something. Someone's like, you're not playing the music. And I was like, what? Uh, let's see right here. The next question is, Shiv, it's your question. And then, uh, wait, we had another one I didn't write down yet. Awesome. Thank you, Adam and Shiv, helping each other out. We got the two vehicles in a row. Question. Stat to one, chapter 12, two vehicles in a row. I'm rewiring everything this weekend. BA is 475, assignment five, 1C. Rewiring everything. New wires coming in tomorrow. I'm going to rewire the whole setup. Hopefully, we have even better streaming. That's the goal. It's, it's great. We use like 95% of the time we don't have problems. 5% of the time we have problems. Don't like that. Getting the. Let me get R pulled up here. But how is everyone doing? How you doing, Shiv? How you doing, Adam? I got so much pulled up. Let me see. How I find it all up? Doing well, Hasm Friday. Yeah, we love some Hasm Friday. 100 points. I agree. Hasm Friday, the best Friday of all Fridays. We get to relax tomorrow. The Haslams, thank you so much. We're getting more caught up on grading on 475. Gonna start probably grading um, the midterms this week, and I'll probably do a lot of that grading. Get to check out everyone's work. Time series regression. Oh, stop being weird. Assignment. And one E was what was asked about. One E. Where is one E? Plot the daily demand versus temperature for all the available data. Here's Scott Plot. What does this say about your model? 
trying to think, like, I don't want to do the full thing. We'll still look at some FPP3 methods and investigate. Right. Going to Gus's Fried Chicken. Or, how about, yeah, doing pretty well. Gus's Fried Chicken sounds awesome. Is that like, like Gus's from, uh, from Breaking Bad? Is that what, like, the places are after? Like, I, I, I've never had Gus's Fried Chicken, I don't think. Sounds good. We are currently at 2558. Okay. So with this, we have plot the deal, the demand versus temperature for the Victorian electricity data. I don't want to do full thing, not just 2014, January, 2014. So using the full data set, aggregate this data daily with the daily total demands. I'm going to the music. <laughs> it's too powerful. Can't handle it. Aggregate it to the daily total demand and the maximum temperatures. Uh, so we can, we can find certain portions from that. Let me see here. Like I'm trying to find like another hourly. It's a classic. I can't believe I've never had it. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I have. Maybe I have. Maximum temperatures create a scatter plot of the temp and demand. What does this say about your model? One way to do this. So going through here, right here, plot, pipe the data through index summary with the two arguments. Did you plot it with the aesthetics? Add the geom point and remember to run your code in parts to see if it, yeah, yes, please run your code in parts. So I'm going to try to use a different data set right here for this one. I don't want to do the exact data sets. Um, just try to put out some answers, but not all the answers. <laughs> um, so let's find a data set that is like hourly. Let me find an hourly data set. No, it's not hourly. The beer data is not hourly. I know that. Where does he say hourly in here? Um, Victorian electric data, of course, that's hourly data. He surely has other hourly data. Um, is it only the Victorian data? Which his whole his whole book right here goes over. Um, you can see a lot of plots on the Victorian data right here. Uh, ooh, see, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Uh, if you look right here, here's the 2014. Um, and the t that's a really interesting pattern. Uh, so you can you can take some of this code right here because he's filtering the data. He's got a filter on it right here. So we could literally go here here and grab this. Uh, but this this isn't this is the temperature. I think maybe he's already filtered his. Maybe I shouldn't show you this. <laughs> he does a lot of the work in the book that we do. Um, let's see right here. Da, 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 da. So he's doing it through the time series graphics. Uh, Vic Electric, year, auto plot demand. So this is, he hasn't done an aggregate of it yet. It's half hour temperatures. So he, he hasn't done all the steps here. So couldn't find, we don't have dplyr R loaded up. So let's go library FPP3, which will load up all the subsequent things we need. And we will get this plot right here. Now, this is not the plot you want though. This is not the plot, but it's starting to go in that direction. Um, because let me just ask this. This is daily data. Um, if this was accurate and it was 2014, how many points should we have? I know this is a crazy question, but if we properly did this, how many points should we have right here? So if this was 2014 daily data, how many dots should be on the screen? If this was 2014 daily data, how many dots should be on the screen? 2014 daily data, how many dots would be on the screen? So you, just, you always want to think about what you're seeing. This is half our, exactly shit right there, 100 points. Um, this is the data right now is half hour data so it's uh data collected every half hour and it's also not just 2014 well it's 2014 once we do this we could simply go right here and do 2012 and do that and we're filtering just the year on the time right there so you could do just 2012 you could do 2013 you can actually make plots that um yep there it goes changing you can actually do like a um a gif of it there's actually like a gg gif thing that you could um like create gifs to watch like the change in electricity demand by year so it would use each one to a gif of it which is pretty cool there's so many neat functions that like endless functions to try out so we want to take and make sure you do this we need to make sure that we have our data aggregated here if you look what are we missing with this right now um, we right now plot the daily demand versus temperature for all the data. And this is daily demand versus temperature. The temperature needs to be maximum temperature. So I want to kind of do the whole aggregate thing with another type of variable. So I think, let's see here. Let's go aggregate wrong. 
Da -da -da -da. Here we go, aggregate. And is he not? He aggregates in here elsewhere. Exercises. I've never done that one. Time series. Two. Wait, what? He should aggregate somewhere else. I know he does. Maybe he doesn't. We should be able to aggregate. Mm. When we aggregate, we're going to bring it together. Disaggregate. That's interesting. I want to grab a different data set that's hourly. So I'm trying to find a data set right now that is not the Victorian electric data set that is hourly within here. So I, I want a non-hourly, it's probably Victorian electric again, isn't it? Wait, 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 here we go. Is this hourly data? No, it's not doing hourly data. Harmonic regression, which is in ours. That's a nice, nice plot right there. He is not, is there only, wait, oh, he's just talking about hourly. Oh, but this is five minute call volumes to banks. So the problem we have right here is, and this makes sense. Um, the problem with this data, yeah, Simon, Simon, of course, to be, you bet. Let me put that down here next. This data set is really interesting. BAS through 20, assignment seven, to be. You bet, Kayla, thank you for being here. Um, this data is bank call volume. So the problem with the bank call volume here is that it's, uh, the bank's not open on Saturday, Sunday. So that creates a lot of issues. He goes through here and kind of corrects the series so we can get the decomp. I was helping some people with this. So I've used this portion of his code with the update Tisbull. Um, so we could probably do, this is like a re-indexing of it. We could probably, but it's not gonna have the daily then. Ugh, uh, 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 uh. So much fun. Well, let's think, does he have any other daily data? Cause I kind of want to not do 100% the assignment. Um, could we do, the weekly. I bet we could aggregate into daily data into like the month. So let's try that. Um, let's try a little aggregate right here. And let's see, because he does it. Well, he does it in other ways. Okay. So he's thinking through the different things we can do. Like I want to do different things. Plot right here. We've got it basically. And I will say this, this is basically the code you're using right here. Uh, but we don't want to filter the data. We can see the full series now. Um, it's got the geom point, the temperature degrees in Celsius, electricity demand right there. Um, so you basically have all the data points, but this is not what we're looking for yet. Oh, no worries. No worries. Doing well today. Doing well. Just finishing off the week right here. Um, but da -da -da. let's see right here. Daily total. Oh, just like, so what we have to do, <laughs> I'll do another component of it because that's, that's a, big thing right here. Um, we need to go through and we need to aggregate it. Aggregate. When we aggregate it. Duh, 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 duh. I did it a few days ago. I was trying to remember how the aggregate works. There's so many functions to remember. I'm going to look up an example here on the other screen. So we'll close that down. Go over here and do aggregate dply all. So using the aggregate function. We want to take, we should be able to aggregate it into the daily amounts. I don't want to summarize yet. So we want to go here. Da, da, da. When I do this is to go through the index by summarize with the arguments. Oh, we want to aggregate first. We already aggregated back here though. I don't think we supplied that code. So cold, the hot temperatures. There it is. Here's where we had you. No, that's where I'm doing it right here. Is there any, I did this a few days ago. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, there it is. This is the start of it. So do you already have the aggregated data right now, Shiv? Sorry, my brain's just jumping around. Do you already have your aggregated data? So have you already created your filtered aggregated data? Because if you already have this right here, then removing just the filter is going to fix the issue. And we were doing that. I want to pull up my previous one, the time series regression seven, I think it was. You already have that? Watch this. Underscore root threshold. 
I think it was seven I was in. I've got so many versions of this on my computer. Uh, did it save it? I didn't save it to that one. Let's see right here. I'm going to go take my aggregate from that where we already had the aggregate. Aggregate. Where's my aggregate? Good afternoon, Gabriel. Great to see you here. We're seeing the long two hours later. It should be. Wait, it was summarized. I'm trying to think like, no wonder my brain's just breaking on the aggregate right there. These are from our previous code right here All right, from number seven. So we'll do the code we've already done right here from the earlier part. We already had this right here and we're storing it into Janvik electric. Probably should call it that right there. This is the daily. It should be the daily. That's the January 2014. And let's go right here, take a look at it and see if it looks accurate. And then basically with this code we have from earlier in the week, we should be good because this is the daily demand right here with the temperature right here. And now what we want to do is we want to take this code right here and simply do what? So once again, Shiv, what do we need to do? My brain was breaking on the code. We wrote it earlier this week. My brain's like, wait a minute. I was like, aggregate doesn't sound right because the summarize is doing the work for us. And we worked with that. Check out earlier in this week where we did the summarize right here. So what should we just do to this code now, Shiv? We're basically doing it. We're basically just going to do it now. What, um, that yeah, don't filter it. Right. So let's just take the code right here. Now, obviously don't, you know, I'm just changing it for the time being, but we'd go down here to this problem all the way down here and not filter it. So plot the daily demand for September for all available data in the data set, aggregate your data as we did create a scatter plot. So what does it say about your model? That uh, one way to do this, that's just help right there. Take your data right here and let's just call it, uh, and nope, let's just say Vic, yeah, Vic daily elect right there. And that should be all the data. That should be everything. And then let's plot that through this and we've got everything we need. And that was straight from the book. Yeah. So what does this say? Well, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is time series or this is time series regression right here. My Wi Fi is acting up so bad. No, I don't think we have any blips. Uh, yeah, no, once you see it, it's like, okay, it's like in my brain, truthfully, sometimes you have just overheats. Uh, sometimes you just can, you're like, what is the code I need? And you're like, what is it? And you're like, well, I've got it written down. Like in the previous assignment, I've got it written down in the seventh version when we did it earlier this week. And you're like, wait a minute, I need to like summarize or aggregate. Which one is it? So we've got it being re-indexed right there. Be careful. Uh, some people used, I was talking to people last night. They did as date from a different thing. I think the zoo function has an as date. Uh, one of them was zoo or something. So they had a different package, uh, doing the, doing the as date, uh, with the fact that certain floors only contain freshmen like the fifth floor Brown, or the fifth floor, the fifth floor, would it still apply? That would make it bias. Good question. Gabriel. Good question. Gabriel right there. I'm watching the first chapter 12 video on demand. Sorry, no worries. And I'm at the cluster sampling in your example. Friday, we asked three floors. We trust in hall. Yep. If you randomly select the floors, that's good, but you could ask, you know, what is a good representative amount of floors? So you'd have to watch out. Good questions, Gabriel, 100 points. And so should, we should have this right here, but uh, so Kayla, do you want to help out 475 and maybe talk a little bit about uh, the model right here? Because there's something we should see pretty cl clearly. I would expand upon this, talk about this, but we're doing time series linear regression right now, and there should be some clear uh, things going on with this. Some clear, hmm, some clear e because we're fitting a time series linear model. Let's kind of fit that to this and then we'll head to the next question. But uh, so, yep, nonlinearity. Yeah, that's and this is 475. This is time series linear regression. Um, and the way we do it in time series linear regression, we write a model right here, time series linear model. And then we put in, wait for it, y tilde and then x. And that should do it da, 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 unless my brain is breaking. There's our model right there. And now we could go into the forecast of the model and all these great things. So we kind of just pipe it through and this is the predict portion. So we can actually make predictions with this right here, predict 50 values and we could make the next 50. Oh, it's mad about something. 
What's the fit? We got the fit. There's the fit of the model right there. And so it did work. And then we could go to the report of it. So let's go to report of it. And guess what the report is going to look like? The report looks just like our models. So this looks just like the summary in 320. And we're doing basically the same things. So this is why 320 is such a good kind of starter for this is because now we're just piping it through. This is summary. I don't think that'll work. Nope, doesn't like it. You have to use report right there uh, to get the report on it. There are other things we could do like augment. Um, augment right here is going to get us values from this, like the uh, residuals, the fitted value, and uh, right here, other values we could use if we really want. But probably the fitted value would be most important. And then we could take the demand value and we could also make plots of this to see what's going on. But overall, there is a nonlinear pattern to this, uh, but you can see all the great things we have. I think uh, that's about does it. Any other questions, Shiv? What are you thinking? Um, just making your model here is important, kind of seeing what's going on with the data. We are doing a time series linear model, which relates to 320. And you can see the output right here with the typical miss. You can see the R squared. Oh, my. Oh, Kayla, what do you think about that? Or what do you think about this? Oh, there's so much to see right here. There is so much to see. Oh my gosh, there is there is a lot of bad stuff to see right here. Wow, I might do one more thing to this. Um, wow, 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 wow. Yeah, it's not statistically it's not statistically significant. It is um, the R squared is close to zero. Let me look up one more thing. I'm going to look up one more thing. Add line, add regression line to ggplot. And then we're going to do the next question. Add regression line to a ggplot. No, I don't want, okay. Here's the person's got the code right here. Uh, GM smooth LM. Sure. Let's do that. I need to actually method LM, but they're doing, okay. There it is right here. Will it work? Will it work? Can't be that easy. Y tilde X. It oh, there it is. Wow. There it is. And what's even better about this, uh, Kayla, is we can take this graphic right here and we should be able to, my brain's breaking, store it into P and go to ggplotly. And this really tells the story. Kale, your thoughts on this um, on this model right here? This is how we can make really nice models. Uh, you can actually see the predictions right here. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts on this model and Shiv? This model right here, which we could have put some titles on it. Uh, let's go to GG title. It's that easy to add a title. You say GG title, and you say temperature uh, predicting daily demand. And we'll say max temperature. And then we'll go here to plus and then GG easy, easy center title. And then we'll go plus. And now we'll take a look at it. Yeah, this is this is about as bad as everything gets. And this is what we'd want to show is that we do not have a proper model here. Um, so there is there's an upwards trend, but it's a polynomial relationship with a kind of group. There seems to be a grouping variable down here. So it looks like there's two polynomial trends. There's some sort of uh, secondary group right here. There's a secondary group right here, um, like the hot and cold days that we talked about previously in the problem. And this is where data analytics comes into play. The reason I'm doing this is I don't want you to think of these problems as a one-off thing. As my brain's like thinking, how do I not teach to the problem? If you notice right here, it didn't ask us to make a graphic like this. It didn't say make a cool GG plot where you fit the line, where you show what's going on. But what did we learn from this? What is your big takeaway about this line right here? What is your big takeaway about this line, which could be easily communicated? Like this line right here, which we did notice, and great job, Kayla and Shiv right there, because I'm kind of blending 320 right now. That line right there is what, which Kayla noticed, this line is what, and the whole thing is kind of now what, which is the big takeaway from this, <laughs> which we should notice. The line is what, and the whole model is probably what. 
I'd be like, well, the line, the whole model, this all, it's non-linear. The line is not statistically significant. This is just a bad idea. Like this is, this is not a good model. It's not useful. There you go. It's not practically significant. If someone gave you this model to predict the demand, this is not a good model. So we want to realize that, that the, funny enough, the temperature is not a good way to predict demand. Who would have thought daily temperature is not a statistically significant model to predict the demand in Victoria, Australia. So um, that is the big takeaway from this. If someone's like, oh, you could use the temperature to pr predict how much demand there's going to be. And you're like, you can't, you re there's, there's variation in it. That's not really, you know, nonlinear. So we would need to use some sort of like polynomial model. It can't be this easy, can it? I'm gonna try something crazy. Nah, because we can't plot it that way. But no, this doesn't work. You can't, you don't, this is a bad model. Let's do the next question. Here we go back. And that's what we want to be thinking about is like, how can we apply what we're doing right here? How can we communicate these ideas? Frankly, you would just say it's a bad model. Like, and if someone said, can you show me? You'd be like, the line is flat. Like you're not, there's no real change. It's close to the naive model. Now you probably won't say words like naive model. Less people be like naive model. And you're like, oh yeah, the naive model, the, uh, the baseline starting model, the flat line average temperature. Uh, we need to know the concepts and then we need to think about how to communicate them without saying the words. <laughs> it's a bad model. The model's useless. Kayla, Kayla, 100 points right there. Saying the model's useless is better than saying it's the naive model. <laughs> it's better just to say this model's useless. And the people are like, okay, okay, you've convinced me. Especially if they trust us, if they know we know our stats and we say the model's useless, they'll be like, okay, model's useless. The model is useless. We do not have practical significance. Okay. About to do the two car question. Let's go check this out. Whoops. Oh, I've already got the timestamp. Wow. I just blinked them in the future. Let's do this two car question. Here we go. A consumer organization estimates that over a one year period, 20% of cars will need to be repaired once. 6% will need to be repaired twice. 1% will need to be re re repaired three or more times. Let's make a table from this data because I'm having trouble remembering it. So we're going to take the data right here and we're going to write it down in a table. And we're going to do the problem. Okay. So with this problem right here, we need to draw it out. All models are wrong and that one is useless like at 100 points. Good coach. George Box said that one time, I'm sure. And here we go. We have the event, the event of your car getting repaired zero times, one times, two times, or three or more times. The probability of said event is going to be listed right here. So we have the probability of these events and I'll have to like squint to see it all. Like, Probability of one repair is 20%. Just a general question on activity seven now and uh, nothing will pop up on the console every time I check regression. Oh, uh, hit enter at the bottom, Kyle. Kyle, I bet if you go to the bottom of your console right here, it's probably asking for a prompt. You probably need to hit enter a bunch of times. It's probably like prompting you to do something. So go down to there to the bottom of your console and hit enter, 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 enter. And it's probably gonna pop up some more graphics uh, because you probably ran check regression X equals true. And that's a common thing. Thank you, Kyle, 100 points for asking. Common issue where people say nothing's running. Yeah, tell me if that fixes it. I bet that's probably the issue. Thank you for asking. That's a very common thing. So hopefully, let's see if we get it. There we go. We have all probabilities, but the probability our car gets repaired zero times. Uh, the probability the car gets repaired zero times is going to be one minus the set of all the other probabilities, which is the complement. Remember everything here, if this is everything that could occur, your car gets repaired zero times, one time, two times, or three or more times, has to add up to a probability of one. So the remaining probability has to be the complement of the other probabilities. Now, what's interesting is, is we could group these. We could put this into the group of repair, and we could put this into the group of not repair. And not repair is simply the probability we see on the screen where repair would have a probability of do, 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 20. Oh my gosh. Brian can't math. <laughs> Brian can't write. Let's 
topics here. Two topics here. There we go. And 27. Da, 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 da. There we go. So the not repair probability is 73%, double check your math, and the repair probability is 27%, the sum of those. So when we think about this, we have our car does not need repairs is 73% probability, and the car does need repairs is 27% probability, because this is some repair. Like, if it gets repaired, it gets repaired. One time, two time, three times, rock knows. It doesn't matter! It's gotten repaired. So now we're talking about two cars. Yeah, is one of the favorites, right, Kayla? We're talking about here two cars. And we want to know that neither will need repairs. So my first car did not need repairs, and my second car did not need repairs. What would we do to these probabilities? So if we have my first car did not need repairs, and my second car did not need repairs. I own two cars. My first car did not need repairs, and my second car did not need repairs. And we'd have to assume that they're independent of each other, which is a big, mighty assumption for this problem. But my first car did not need repairs, and my second car did not need repairs. So we would what these probabilities right here. For the first car, it did not need repairs, and the second car did not need repairs. So we want to write this down as a table, be like, okay, not repairs, did not need repairs is that probability. The first car did not need repairs, and the second car. Oh, close, get hey, Kayla, 100 points. We won't add them. And a good check for this, and a really good check. Kayla, 500 points. Thank you for, don't worry, we're here to practice. We won't add back. If you add them, you will get a probability that is greater than one. So if you were to add them, um, then the probability would exceed one, which is not a proper probability. So something, something happened bad. When we say the word and, we will multiply. And let's write a quick note right here. And is multiply, which has the condition of independence. And or is addition, which has the disjoint condition. And that's just a quick note for us to remember that those are the conditions. So I heard a bunch of air messages came up twice. So I clicked the comments again. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Kyle. Are you on Discord, Kyle? If you can, we can hop on a quick call. Chapter 12 homework? Yeah, let me know which one. Blake, we can definitely check out. Can you do the light bulb question? Yeah, we'll do light bulb question. Let me put it on the list. I just saw that. Uh, let me put light bulb question. We got two questions before that. And then we'll do light bulb question. So we have enough time to get to that, it looks like. Chapter 12, light bulb question. Yep, we got enough time to get to that, it looks like. Uh, but Kyle, if you're on the Discord, let me know. And we can hop on and do a quick little look at screen thing here. Um, yeah, that could help. That could help. And if you're not, we can hop on the discord real quick. I'll like go to an intro screen thing and I can look on the discord. That makes it really easy for me to see and be like, Oh, do this, do this, do this. Usually I can fix it in like super quick. Um, so we would multiply right there. <laughs> I know lipo question is a fun one. So this would equal the answer to a, that's the answer right there. 0.73 times 0.73. The next one says both will need repairs. So Kayla, anybody? For some points in the chat, what is the probability both cars will need repairs? So my first car needs repairs and my second car needs repairs. My first car needs repairs and my second car needs repairs. So my first car needs repairs and my second car needs repairs. What's the probability of that? My first car needs repairs and my second car needs repairs. Uh, so what's the probability of repairs? And then the first needs repairs and the second. Ah, oh, you might have that. That might be the first probability Shiv it looks like. And great work, Shiv and Kayla. Keep it up. The, I think, Shiv, you found the first one. My first one did not need repairs. And my second one did not need repairs. The first need repairs and the second need repairs is going to be uh, multiplying the probability of the first needs repairs and the second need repairs. Does that make sense right there? Oh, no worries, Shiv. It's just good practice. Shiv, another 100 points. Um... Awesome, great to hear that, Kyle. I think I messed up the character. I mean, the one where it's multiplication rule, but it asks for you. The reason was right. Oh no, is it the other one, Cassandra? I which car? There's two car questions. And so the last one right here says at least one car needs repairs. So think about this: it is either the case that no cars need repairs, or at least one. Relate at least one this way. One of these things must occur. It is either the case that none of our cars need repairs or at least one car needs repairs. 
we've already figured out the probability of no cars needing repairs. The word or right here is just addition. And now we can figure out the probability at least one of our cars needs repairs. We're trying to figure out the probability at least one car needs repairs. So the probability of no cars needing repairs is 0.73 times 0.73. There's the probability right there. So we can just do the probability of at least one. This stands for at least one is equal to one minus the probability of no cars needing repairs, 0 0.5329. So either it is the case that none of our cars will need repairs or at least one car will need repairs and that would equal up to one. So then we can solve for the probability of at least one by just doing algebra right here. I said, oh yeah, I think for the second one, great job, Kale, right there. I think that is right for the second one. Um, so let me see right here. Let's do the, that is the, let me double check. This is the first answer right here. This is the second answer is one minus. We showed it on the screen. I'm gonna take Kayla's answer in good faith right here that it is 0 0.0729. Kayla, let's continue the streak. Kayla, great job, 100 points right there. Taking it in good faith. And what Kayla did was, we'll show Kayla's mathematics. She did 0.27 times 0.27 right there to solve for the probability of both cars need repairs. The first car needed repairs and the second car needed repairs. The third one is everything but no cars needing repairs solved down here on the bottom. Um, so good question, uh, good practice of the multiplication rule. When we say two things happen, like this happens and then this happens. And then the last one uses the addition rule to say, it is either the case that none of your cars need repairs or at least one of your cars need repairs. And that has a probability of one. So then we can solve for the probability of at least one car is needing repairs by doing the probability of no cars needing repairs and subtracting that. That is the probability uh, right here. We just algebra it over to the other side. So a good question, a good last question. Um, no, Chi-Chi. The question had the multiplication rule of 0 0.8 times 0 0.8 and said there is a 64 chance that the two wheels in a row are both speeding. Oh, speeding question. Let's do that next. Uh, what was wrong with the reasoning? Oh, cool. Let's do the car speeding reasoning question. Here we go. Okay. So Cassandra, sorry about that. Let me do this one next. We're jumping the line on the questions. Thank you. I did the wrong car question. No, oh, there's a bunch of car questions. Okay. Oh, you did say two vehicles in the row. Rewiring everything. Uh, vehicle repairs. Okay. So next question, let's do the vehicles in a row question. Sorry about that, Cassandra. And here we are with the vehicles in a row question. Okay, here we go. Vehicles in a row, let's do it. Okay, pretend you are out on the highway. Yeah, good practice. And so you're out on the highway. Life is a highway. I wanna ride it. All in a, there we go. So with this, you go out to I-40 and it's 520. Here's you on I-40 at 520. This is you. Tell me how fast do you want to go? The little. That's you right there. How fast do you want to go on I-40 at 520? So at 520, how fast do you want to go on I-40? Doing some top tier drawings. How fast do you want to go? Seventy. You'd love to go seventy, right? Maybe it's good. You know, like I want to go seventy. We'll take a look. Uh, it looks like you are in a what right here? You're in a what right now? It looks like you are in a what? You're in a traffic jam on this side of the highway right here. Your speed would be what? You're in a jam right there. Your speed right now would what on the person in front of you? The people in front of you, your speed would be what on the people in front of you? So think of a key word right here. Your speed would what on the people in front of you on the highway? It would depend. And we just said a second ago that a big thing when we multiply uh, probabilities is that we need to have independent it'd probably be equal to our less than, right? It'd be equal to our less than. So we can say like your ability to speed is going to be uh, dependent on the person in front of you being able to speed. If they're not able to speed because the traffic is too slow, then you can't speed. I'm not saying you should speed, please drive carefully, but uh, your speed is going to be dependent, not independent. 
and that's a violation of the rule of multiplication. On the other side of the highway, we can see people can speed because there's more room for them to speed. So over here, their speed is not dependent, but there are times on the highway where your speed will depend on the people in front of you. And that is a key rule for multiplying. So it says right here, we're gonna use the multiplication rule. And the first thing you should think when you see multiplication is, are these two probabilities independent? Remember, when we multiply probabilities, they need to be independent. So say, I have multiplied probabilities, are they independent? And so let's look right here. There are cases when the speed of one car is not independent of the speed of another car. So the multiplication rule does not apply and that looks perfect. Now, disjoint, if you see the word disjoint, what would they be needing to do up here? So Cassandra, this is really good practice. If you see the word disjoint, then they would need to be doing what with the probabilities. So if you see disjoint, you'd be like, oh, then that would apply if they're trying to do what with these. If you see the word disjoint, it would exactly K a great practice, 100 points again. So if you see disjoint, then it would be if they're doing some sort of addition right here. So uh, if they were trying to add them to say this car speeds or this car speed, which both cars can speed, so they're not disjoint either. Like car one could speed, car two could speed. They can both happen at the same time, so they're not disjoint. So they can't add them, but it doesn't talk about uh, using the addition rule. It says they're not just disjoint, which is true, but the addition rule would not apply. So if this said uh, they are not disjoint, so we can't use the addition rule, that would be a true statement, but we're multiplying them. So the, the actual thing we'd care about is the, uh, the independence condition. When you multiply, you need to check. Awesome, Cassandra, 100 points. Thank you so much. Uh, make sure to remember the disjoint is with the addition rule. The multiplication is with the independence rule. So how do we check those rules? Independence means if we know one, it tells us nothing about the other. Where disjoint means if one happens, the other can't happen, which actually means they're 100% dependent in that instance. A uh, good review, and we did a lot of class on that yesterday. A lot of practice. So practice it up. Those are the tougher concepts of this chapter, kind of where we spend, you know, a good part of the lecture. Let's go back to the main screen. Cassandra, I just want to throw you another 100 points. Thank you so much for asking about that. And if I get the wrong question, just let me know. Um, sometimes my brain just says, wait a minute, the two car question. <laughs> we just lost that one. Let's see your assignment. Uh, well, we're going to jump the line and go to 320 right here next. Because I think uh, Shiv and Adam are helping each other out. So we'll go check out and put the light bulb question next. We've got just enough time to do these ones right here. There we go. And so we got BAS 320, Kayla 320 time. What was for dinner last night, Kayla? I think you said chicken and all that good stuff. I was really saying last night. I've got I'm about to make chicken. I can't I can't type. <laughs> um, what do we? We had we had turkey pot pie for dinner last night. It was so good. Uh, Marie Calendar turkey pot pies. Um, try them if you've never had them. I highly recommend them. They are amazing. We'll see. Chicken penne. Hello, oh, HelloFresh? You do HelloFresh? Yeah, raw chicken hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd i love to do some HelloFresh. I don't know. It sounds, yeah, good stuff. I was there the whole time, though. That's awesome. I figured out the light bulb question. It was stat. Oh, you're stat legend. Blake, another 100 points. Great job. Blake, congratulations. We could still do it. Um, Blake, great job. Proud of you. I'm Blake, I'm 3,500 points. Blake, great job. It's it's another, did you look at the other? It's in at least one problem. It's like the soda problem. I, I only did because I got a free box from a friend. Perfect. That is highly approved. Highly approved. It's the way to do things. Get that free Hello Fresh box and cancel the subscription. Stat to one approved. I, I was thinking, I so I'm trying to think of that April Fool's joke. I've, I ran it by my department and we're, we've got to revise it, Kayla. So if you message me like some ideas, I ran it by my department. They're like, yeah, that's funny. But if one in 1,000 students thinks like, and then there could be a problem. Um, but I was thinking, I don't know, one of these days I might do like a vol means all stat to a one charity marathon. I don't know. I'll, I don't know. I just come up with some crazy ideas in my head. Galaxy Brian here, great job shift right there. Um, so I, I think of crazy ideas. Like I was thinking this morning, I was like, we should do a vol means all uh, stat to a one marathon where we do like a pledge a thon or something. Like, it wouldn't be i don't want you guys donating i want to get like some big names on here like i'd love it if dolly pardon would appear and donate and like we could give it out to like different things at ut like all the different groups and try to spread it out among a very diverse group of like just like make a list of things and like give it to like like spread it out like 10 percent to 10 different groups for vol means all i don't know i think that'd be cool you know i think about what like what are we doing in life 
And I like to think, can we do some really cool, impactful things? Well, right now, hey, Kayla, we got both Kayla's here. Like, well, not like a running, no, no, no. Like we do it like a streaming marathon where I stream for like five hours and then we have on like Dolly Parton appear, uh, favorite Olive Garden order. <laughs> um, So like Dolly Parton. Uh, yeah. You have Kayla's here in that too? Yeah. Kayla's. Yes. I love that the two Kayla's. Yeah. She made uh, chicken penne last night. Um, We were talking about she, last night she came in. Kayla, Kayla uh, G, you got to drop your quote, quote 112, right? And then we'll get serious here in a second. We're having a little bit of fun here and off. Oh, no, I did quote 122. I don't even know what quote 122 is. I'm about to drop your quote in the chat. And then we're going to get serious right here. Could you go over the interpretations of GG time series residuals? Uh, uh, yep. Free tiny brain. <laughs> we'll do some GG time series residuals. <laughs> Let me do. Would you prefer that, Shiv? Uh, so uh, GG time series residuals. Okay, let's get serious here. We're having a little bit of fun, relaxing. Um, and went to hot. Nice, Kayla B. That's awesome. I, I cooked I cooked pot pies last night. Pre-made. I, I turned on the oven to 400. I put the 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 aluminum foil around the pot pies. And then at 50 minutes, I took off the aluminum foil. I rotated them a little bit and made some good pot pies. Aw. I'll never aw. I just love this. I'm gonna hit <laughs> let's do the next question. Here we go. Okay, we're talking about some variance inflation factor right here. So as a whole, stock commodity prices are often strongly correlated with each other. Um, <laughs> love it. Um, so there may be a large amount of redundant information in the predictors. Calculate the cutoff for a large variance inflation factor. So this is VIF right here, variance inflation factor. <laughs> and comment on whether multicollinearity is a problem in this model. I just love the chat. And so... Um, let's go ahead and make a model right here. And then we'll talk about what variance inflation is. And, uh, let's take a look. Okay. So first thing we need to do is make a model. I'm going to do this for a separate, different type of data set. So not your data. And let's take a look. So we're going to make a model here, not your data. Like, let me do this a whole bunch, not your data. Let's go ahead and pull up some data. Uh, you know where we're going if you're rotating the class with me. It's not loaded up because we don't have reg class loaded. So we got to load up reg class to get to our favorite data set of all time. You know it is survey 10. So let's go to survey 10, and I'm only going to take a certain amount of data from this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's go there. Okay, so we're going to go here and go to survey 10. And we will go to columns two through eight. There it is. And let's call S10, nope, S10 sub. There it is right there. S10 sub is a subset. What have I done? Oh, I still got that error. S10 sub is a subset right here. Um, nice job, Kayla. And so we're gonna go right here and make a linear model explaining someone's weight uh sure it'll be good mm, no we're gonna include that in this we're gonna do gpa i'll explain why from all the variables data equals this okay now that we have our model what we've done right here and let's talk a little bit about what multicollinearity is so uh both kale's in the chat talking about some hot yoga right there so would you would you want to go to five different hot yoga studios and so this is, you, you say, why are we talking about hot yoga? Why are we saying, why would you go to hot yoga studio one? And we're, we're not saying like, you just go to try them out. You, I'm saying in your weekly routine, you have uh, yoga studio one, yoga studio two, and you know, we'll, we'll just call them X's, you know, I don't know why, because it relates to the model, but you would go to all five different hot yoga studios right here. Is, does that sound like a good idea? Like in your weekly routine, you have five different ones you go to, you're like, that's kind of doing what right there. You kind of want what right here with our model. This relates to our model now. Absolutely not. That's a bad idea because it does a unique thing in your life, right? Like you want this to be going to the hot yoga studio. Then you want the next thing not to be going to another hot yoga studio. You want it to be like picking up groceries. That's a unique thing in your life that, you know, when you bring it into the model, which is your life, it doesn't overlap in the variation that you need. <laughs> oh, nice job. And so we want to bring unique things to our model, not go to five different hot yoga studios. We only, we only need one. We need variety. 
our X's need to do unique things. So we have a way of looking at this with our model. As soon as you create a model, you can look at it to see if it overlaps in what they bring with the variance inflation factor. So the variance inflation factor tell us where the overlap is. And I am not shocked at this, and this is a great example. Where do we see the overlap? And now this is called multicollinearity, but it's probably due to these two variables being very similar. Where do you see the biggest overlap between what these are bringing to the model? Which variables in the list right here have a huge overlap probably, but it's called multicollinearity because it's not just the two variables interacting, that would be collinear. Multicollinearity means in the multiple sense, this one variable is highly explained by the other variables in the model, but probably due to a lot of overlap between two of them. So where do we see the big overlap right here? Ah. So the higher the variance inflation factor, the more the overlap there is between that X with other X's. So the bigger the number, the bigger the number on the screen right now, the more, uh-huh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you're seeing it. So the bigger the number on the screen, desired weight is our biggest one. And then the next biggest one is what? And think about how that, like, wait a minute, that kind of makes sense because that kind of even overlaps with what it's written. So the, the question here is an X that is someone's desired weight. And then we also see overlap with weight. So that brings a lot of the same information. This is like hot yoga studio one, hot yoga studio two, getting groceries, uh, daycare for kids, making dinner. So these overlap in what they do, like they, they're doing the same thing for our model. That's not good. We want our X's to bring unique things, not be virtually similar. So the higher this number, the higher the variance inflation. Um, well, they are different. So they're not completely the same, but they do have a lot of overlap. So think about this, like, uh, I want to weigh, uh, I want to weigh probably 170 and I probably weigh 180 right now. So I want to weigh 170. I, I don't want to, I don't know. I'm yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants to weigh whatever they want to weigh, but your desired weight probably has something to do with what you weigh. If you say to someone how much you want to weigh and they say 110, well then their weight might be kind of correlated to that to a certain degree. I'm not saying everyone's going to be right near their, their desired weight, but it's probably in some way you could, you know, get a good estimate. There's some sort of correlation relationship between what someone weighs and what they want to weigh. Not everyone's going to be close to it, but those are the two most kind of related variables. And this is in a multicollinear sense. Um, so we have to ask the question right here is, is there too much exactly? Is, is there too much multicollinearity in this model? Is there too much of the X's explaining the X's? And to view this, we can do the following formula. We can take the uh, R squared of our model and the R squared of our model is this. Woo! How's this model look like? Ooh, what? That's weird. The model is very, very what, Kayla? Both Kayla's. <laughs> the model is very, 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 very what? We're trying to explain someone's GPA and the model is very this. It's super this. I'm shocked by that. It's very statistically significant but it only explains 6% of the variation in someone's GPA. And it typically misses someone's GPA by about 0.6, which is a pretty big miss. Like, I think you have a 3.3 and you're like, I have a 2.7. I'm like, well, that's within the typical miss. And you're like, well, that's, that's over a half point away from my actual GPA. You probably just say most people have about a 3.0 and probably get a pretty good guess. You know, the intercept is 3.5. So you could just guess 3.5 and probably be a pretty good guess and be like, yeah, you'd cover the distance of three to four with the typical miss. So we want to take this R squared right here and ask, using the VIF formula, what would be a too high of a VIF? So this formula here, one over one minus R squared is actually how VIFs are calculated from the R squared sub I. Uh, check out last night's video where I go into a much bigger, uh, since we've only got 14 minutes left, I go into a much bigger talk on the activity on how we get the R squared sub I, which is the R squared for the ith X in the model. So R squared sub I stands for the R squared of the ith X in the model. This model is a Y variable right here. So this is just your regular old R squared. If you take the regular old R squared and plug it into the VIF formula, which falls, solves for the VIFs right here, you can actually get the VIF cutoff. Do you see VIF cutoffs here that are too high? Which is what the question is asking about with different data. 
And so 1.06 is when it's too high. Good question. Oh, good, good seeing you, Kayla. I saw the question mark first. Just wondering if you have a template over there. Yes, definitely. I'll be looking over tonight. Definitely, Kayla. Thank you so much with the Milton stuff. Thank you so much. And I, I was looking over your keyword stuff. It's awesome. I'm really excited because I think this is, like I said, this week we'll get the data. We'll start spinning it up. That's awesome. And I'll take a look at it by tomorrow. And so we'll have our meeting. And I'm picking up my suit tomorrow for the wedding. Ay! Don't worry, that's earlier in the day. So it'll be good. Um, exactly weight, height, desired weight. Those all, oh yes, 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 the variables, correct. These all have too high of overlap. Oh, thank you, Kayla, both Kayla's. Uh, there's too high of overlap. And so there is issues with, oh, I should, I mean, I'll, I don't know. See, I'll, I'll tell Chelsea like, oh, let's do this. <laughs> she's more private than I am. I'm like, whatever. This is like, we'll just stream the wedding on the internet. But is this making sense right here, Kayla? I know we had a lot of fun during this question. Um, but is it making sense right here how we can find the high cutoff for variance inflation? At what point do our X's have too much shared variation? And the point at which we would say our X's have too much shared variation is if they have a variance inflation factor higher than this, calculated on a model, de model dependent variance inflation. Remember, this was the R squared of our model. So that's the R squared of your model that would get plugged in there. So find the R squared of your model, plug it into that. That's your cutoff. Look at your VIFs. My VIFs are too high. There is too much overlap between these X's between each other. And it's not just like one X and another X. It's multicollinear. So desired weight has too much overlap with the other X's. To show this, uh, does, does GPA the first one? We're good. With that, yeah, we'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Watch this. That variable right there, desired weight, you can subtract variables. If you were to take this value right here, 7.137, that is the value right there, 7.13. Uh, different decimals, depending on the way it carries it. But that is the value of the R squared sub i. So this time I did it with the R squared sub i. The multicollinearity has me confused. Yeah, no worries. Good question, good practice right here. I think we got time for just a little bit more. We've got, well, we, they said they solved the light bulb question that is in last day's, yesterday's video. Oh, we didn't mark the timestamp on this. Good review. I think about here, I need to put check time on this. And then we'll do the time series residuals, check time. Yes, they said they solved the light bulb. Let's look at some GG time series residuals. Uh, let's go back here. Okay, GG time series residuals, 475. Uh, so Kayla, once again, if you're hanging out, you're gonna to get to see a little 475 time series residuals. So very similar stuff. Trying to pull up the code right here. I'll lose it. Very, very, very similar. I'm always losing my code. Awesome. Bye. No worries. Go ahead. Got to give naps. Do it. Do it. Do it. All right. Checking my code to make sure it works. Let's go check out GG Time Series Residuals. Do, do, do. Here we go. Okay. So I already got the code pulled up. What do we need to get the time series residuals? We need a model. So to get the time series residuals, you need to take your model right here and pipe it through into the GG time series residuals. And wow, 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 wow. This right here is a mess. So what are we first looking at right here? This is the time ordered residuals and the time ordered residuals show a pattern. Um, I had a 201 person, no, 320 was it, asking about why do we not want to see patterns? Patterns means we have unexplained portions of the data. We also see evidence of nonlinearity in here because zero should be at the center of it at all times. So it's going below zero, it's going above zero, below zero, above zero, uh, not constant variation. This is a really good clean pattern, um, but not really sure if I interpreted it correctly. Uh, so when you look at this right here, how should the top thing look, Shiv? So the top thing, you want to look how? The top thing should look like a white noise pattern, which looks completely what? 
So when you're looking at the top one right here, it should look, and I could do some better residuals here in a moment that we see, but the top one should look complete. It, sh it should look random. It should look completely random. Oh, there's so many patterns in that. Uh, it's auto-correlated right here, heavily uh, auto-correlated because you can see like an up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down pattern and like a, a, a weavy pattern through this. So it's heavily auto-correlated. There's so much auto-correlation. You also have some extreme outliers here. So you have some extreme points which show up down here in the histogram. We don't like histograms, but still. Um, there's extreme points which don't go with the pattern, but uh, overall you see a a a bend to it which is not good it's it's got a pattern like that it's got an up down pattern so there's like three reasons this is bad right here reason number one bendy nonlinear pattern so it's it should be centered at zero at all times random around zero reason number two it's got some sort of uh up down up down up down pattern we don't like that either no pattern we don't want any patterns and then reason number three we do see some extreme outliers uh that are changing the variation um, also look at this, there's kind of this like no man zone right here. There's kind of this area where residuals aren't really occurring well between they're kind of following like this and this, which if you, if you remember our graphic from earlier, we saw like two, two patterns in it. So you're kind of seeing the low and the high model. So there's like two models here and, uh, yeah, it's not good. So this is really bad, really bad. Now down here, we see some of the big problems. We were just talking about correlation in R squared a second ago. Uh, the auto correlation is super high on the first right here. Uh, the first uh, order, which would mean yesterday's uh, residual is dependent on today's residual. And we don't like that. The miss today is dependent on the miss yesterday. Can I send the graph that I have on Discord? Having a hard time determining if it's random. Uh, yeah, send it on Discord. Let me take a look at that. Send it on Discord. Let me see. And over here, the histogram does not look unimodal symmetric. We see the bimodality of it. So this area right here. So this shows very high autocorrelation on lag one through multiple lags. There's spikes. Oh, definitely what? There's a definitely what going on right here, Shiv. So there's definitely a what. It's very clear that we have not taken into account a what right here. We have not taken into account a what right here. So there's definitely this. There's definitely something right here. I'm gonna go grab a code and I'm gonna try to fit a much better model on this. I wanna see how good we can make this model. We are gonna try to make a real model for this. We're gonna finish off the office hours today with a real model. We're gonna find a really good model for this. Let's see right here. We are, we are gonna get the actual model for this. Let's get the actual model. Here we go. Is it going to just estimate that for me? So it knows it's daily. So it should be able to figure that out. I hope it will. Let's go ahead and just grab these and see what it does with these. Well, we'd have to select. We'll just do this one. Just stop. Only the best model. Thank you, Kiva, right there. <laughs> let's go ahead. Let's drop a model in here, a better model. I wouldn't do this. Well, like, this is not your assignment right now, but... And then, shit, I'll take a look here in a second. Um, da, 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 must be a Mabel. Contain all the models. Uh, what's it mad about? Oh, wait. Oh, my gosh. Object employed. Okay. Um, what am I doing employed data? There we go. Up, oh, it found it. Found the seven daily pattern. And I was good. GB time series residual. Much better. Better. Some problems still, but Shiv, this is much better. Now the problem is outliers and some high auto correlation on certain lags. Let me go grab the auto arima on this and have it search for me. Um, so I'm gonna grab the auto arima instead. And we haven't learned arima models yet, but I with the with the weekly pattern on this, it just looked like it should be done with an auto arima or something. So this this is what I would actually be doing with time series right here. I'd be like, okay, we need to just use an auto arima probably on this. And let's see 
once again employed our data is called demand and now it's running and let's take a look and shiv let me take a look do 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 shiv route um it's a small series is wait are we doing we're doing this one right here which one are we doing we're doing is that the there might be some sort of pattern it looks like it's going non-linear it looks like there's a bend to it it's small does it only want you to do january um it's too the histogram is too little of data the histogram is probably too little of data this is what auto arima can do to your computer um so to shiv to yours it's only january um to your output shiv there's no significant autocorrelation there seems to be maybe slight evidence of non-linearity by the middle of January. Um, the series is rather small for us to make conclusions. The histogram does not show any extreme outliers. Um, does that make sense, Shiv, as I said, as I'm looking at your graphic? Uh, the autocorrelation comes back fine, even though lag one has a slightly high spike. It's not significant correlation at lag one. Uh, the, the, uh, the residuals might show slight non-linearity. Uh, I'd like to continue the series further to see this. There's a slight upward over zero mark at uh, the middle of January, January 14th to January 24th or so. Uh, the histogram looks slightly normal. Um, I don't see any big problems with the histogram. Good stuff right there. This is what auto Arima does. It's a search procedure to find the best Arima model, and it's having some fun right now. I'll have to end off search here in a moment, but we'll probably start class with this. I'd love to see it. Got it. Oh, it did it. Here's the output. What? No. No. It went from... Why would it do that? It went from this... The ACF looks really bad right now. So there's probably a better model than Arima. It's saying the residuals are better? I don't know about that. Auto Arima might not have found, but I did stepwise equals false, so it should have done all of them. So this is the best model in the search grid. And it beats out this model right here, which has better looking residuals. Let me look at the. They're kind of close, but the ACF looks horrible right here. That's got a major pattern. Hmm. Well, no one said predicting uh, demand for Victorian electricity was easy. It's uh, we still have a lot of issues, a lot of autocorrelation in this data. And if we were to run a, uh, we have our model right here. I should have saved it. Uh, in truth, if you're gonna run something this big, you wanna store this into the fit to not keep running it. And that's why we usually store something into an object because if I'm gonna keep running this and piping things through it, it'd be better to store it into the fit object and then use that fit object for later on. Um, and that's, we haven't even done Arimas yet, but if I keep running this, it's gonna take as long as it did like another five minutes to run it. But with that, we'll be back here with some time series soon. Until then. Bye for now, everyone. Bye. Do better. Run. Ah!